everyone. Uh, welcome to our February case conference. We are um, very excited with our guest expert today. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Mary Armanios uh, as our guest expert for this case conference. Uh, I think you all are going to be in for a real treat. Mary has presented to us before. I think it was a while ago, but she agreed to come back. So we are thrilled about that. So um, Dr. Armanios is professor of oncology, genetic me medicine, pathology, and molecular biology and genetics at Johns Hopkins. Her research over the last 16 years has focused on understanding the role of telomeres and telomerase in disease. She's defined the spectrum and genetic basis of the telomere syndromes and with her trainees dissected their underlying mechanisms. She's also the co-founder and inaugural director of the Telomere Center and oversees a unique telomere clinic that many of you may have used because we all tend to reach out to Dr. Armanios for some of these complex cases. Of note, Dr. Armanios also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think it was early last year, on POT1, which is going to be the topic she educates us on. So Dr. Armanios will get started, and then we have a collection of four cases um, that were externally submitted that I'm really hoping we have time to review as well. So take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. It's great to be back. And it's a pleasure to be here with the eye care community. Um, I want to just uh, give a disclosure and a warning up front. This is a tough and evolving area of cancer genetics, and I may not have all the answers today, so forgive me. But what I hope to go over with all of you is some of the biology, which hopefully will help us explain what is going on here to patients. And as we try to um, figure out how to best help them and counsel them, this, I will warn you, is not a straightforward cancer predisposition syndrome. And it's very hard, I think you will see from, uh, at least based on what I have learned so far over the last several years, to go from a paper, even if it's published in the New England Journal, to uh, a guideline that is straightforward. So bear with me while we do that, but I think we are still learning. So just by way of background, telomeres protect chromosome ends, and uh, they have been linked. Their length has been linked to aging processes. As our cells divide and as we age, our telomere length is supposed to get shorter. The problem with POT1 mutation carriers is that this process does not happen. And just to give you the punchline up front, that even though this process is linked to aging and cellular aging, it is highly protective against cancer. And when it is disrupted, cancers develop and benign tumors develop in almost every organ. So just to continue the background that telomerase is the is the enzyme that lengthens telomeres normally and um, its function is highly, highly regulated. And all of these components here in color are uh, components and proteins and uh, that are involved in telomerase assembly or biogenesis or its recruitment to the telomere. And many of the genes that encode these components are mutated in the short telomere syndrome. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction about the short telomere syndromes because I think understanding them helps us uh, look at the POT1 mutation carriers as well. Here's POT1, the topic of our conversation today. And I will just tell you right now, it is one of the most commonly mutated genes in um, cancer patients. But you'll see here that some of these other genes that are mutant in the short telomere syndromes with an S uh, subscript are also mutated in what I'm going to call the long telomere syndrome. So why is this uh, important? It's important to distinguish these disorders and not, I think, call them simply as a bucket list of telomere biology disorders. First, the short telomere disorders are the ones that we have been studying for a long time and that we discussed the last time I was here in eye care. And these patients predominantly get two types of cancer. They get myelodysplastic syndrome, and I'll show you in a second, in rare cases, squamous cell cancers. 
the pot one mutation carriers have, I think, the opposite problem. So the short telomere syndromes, you might be asked even as a cancer geneticist to give opinion about patients with lung disease. These are patients who have short telomere length, and the proportion of them that is accounted for by mutations in this pathway is enormous. It is about a third of familial cases, and familial cases are very common. And we made the initial discovery here in 2007 in collaboration with colleagues at Vanderbilt. So in contrast, though, to what was published in basic science papers that short telomeres fuel genome instability, we published uh, last year the largest and the longest experience in of cancer incidence in the short telomere disorders. And you'll see here, compared to some of the other disorders we talk about at eye care, like Lee Fraumani or BRCA, where the penetrance is basically 100%, these patients have relatively lower uh, penetrance of cancer, and many of these cancers end up being indolent or curable, and the cause of death is primarily from lung disease. So this is, it's important to, I think, keep this in mind. And I will just say one or two words more about the short telomere-related cancers. All the solid tumors, pretty much, that arise in the short telomere setting are related to an immune deficiency. And sometimes uh, patients have not only an innate or a primary immune deficiency, but they also uh, had received iatrogenic immune suppression because people had mistaken their lung disease for autoimmune, and then they develop these cancers in their skin or in the mouth. And the biology here is striking, if I may just share it with you. We tested the ability of cells, T cells, from mice with short telomeres to see and suppress tumors that were immunogenic. So compared to the wild type mouse where the tumor grows a little bit and gets suppressed, and also in a mouse that has long telomere length but no telomerase, mice with short telomere length, they cannot see these tumors. And even if they see them initially and can suppress them, there is this resurgence. And I think these data highlight the importance of T cell immunity in cancer um, immune surveillance with aging. And I thought you might be interested in this uh, piece of data also that short telomere animals, when you look at the tumors, they have these brown dots here, which are T cells that have infiltrated the tumor. But by the time we come back a week later, uh, three weeks later, the cells have disappeared. So T cells that have short telomeres cannot survive for very long and they get exhausted. And that is why these patients get solid tumors not because they have genomic rearrangements. So Dr. Powell asked me to come and talk about long telomere lens. So I'm gonna switch to that now. So, you know, short telomere length has been linked to processes of aging. It's not all aging phenotypes, it's aging of the lung and aging of the blood primarily in the immune system. So there has been in the pop culture this impression that long telomere lines should be equated with youthfulness. And we have been looking for a long time for individuals that may have long telomere length excessively. And the reason we were uh, particularly focused on POT1 is because POT1 has somewhat confusing functions molecularly. Some basic science papers have suggested that helps telomerase function and therefore loss of function here may cause uh, shortening of the telomere. And some have suggested that POT1 actually uh, puts a break on telomerase elongation and therefore we would expect the telomere length to be longer. And when I came to the eye care, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago or two years ago, uh, we were just starting to recruit patients with POT1 mutations and Dr. Pal and I, and I'm very grateful for her help. We uh, was very encouraging in pursuing this line of, work, line of work. But this paper reminds me to tell you why we have four cases uh, today 
in this study of almost uh, 11,000, 10,000 patients with adults with cancer, POT1 mutations, loss of function, heterozygous mutations were among the top 10 or 15 cancer prone genes with the others being very familiar uh, genes. So this is this is not uncommon, but as you will see, we still don't know how to interpret all the variants, nor do we have um, a strategy for screening that can help all patients. So it's a little bit more individualized and that complicates the discussions, especially when this field is a little bit early. So when we collected uh, telomere length from uh, five families, each of them had a proband with melanoma, we found that mutation carriers with POT1 had not short, but long, in fact, sometimes super long telomere length and definitely longer than their relatives. And what was interesting is when we talked to the patients and when I met them, I noticed that they had, uh, they looked younger than their age. And the best way to sort of measure that and, and reflect it in a table was a table showing how old people are when they go gray or when they have at least 10% of their hair being gray. So in this study of the 17 or so patients, we had almost all the ones that were over the age of uh, 65 had very minimal hair graying uh, before the age of 50 or 60, which is quite striking and also associated with a subjective impression that they were they looked younger than their age. But we know, um, at least now, that long telomere length does not come with a free pass, even though there may be this cosmetic uh, advantage, because these patients had multiple tumors. Many of them were benign, and I want to emphasize that, and that will be relevant for our conversation related to screening. So this woman, for example, in her 70s had melanosis of the eye, which is not melanoma, just an aggregation of melanocytes. Here, this patient had a goiter, again, a benign tumor. But then there were patients that had uh, renal cell cancers, multifocal, uh, as well as a very devastating uh, young patient who died at the age of seven from glioblastoma multiforme. When you assemble the data from all the patients side by side from the five families, it looks like something like this. And we have data from uh, at least 30 others now, and it looks very similar. Going from young to old, the penetrance of cancer increases with the most common cancers being melanoma and thyroid tumors. But there's also in this category of other solid neoplasms, sarcoma, kidney cancer, some epithelial tumors, including colon cancer, but also notice the benign tumors. Many of the women here had uterine fibroids. Many of them, as I'll show on the next slide, had uh, benign nevi, uh, as well as various random connective tissue tumors that were also benign. But I think from a biological point of view, and this is what I really want to make sure that we all can take home here, because it, it does seem that the longevity of the cells makes these patients prone to having a spectrum of phenotypes. So, you know, in goiters, the thyroid uh, cells just grow unchecked, but they're not able to metastasize. In the hair, the melanocytes live longer, and that is why they can give pigment to the hair. Uh, but in rare cases, or in, in, in rare cases, it becomes invasive melanoma. Most of the time, it's going to be these benign nevi or localized melanoma. And then we were interested in the blood because we know that with, with aging, some people uh, develop high lymphocyte counts. And we could see that spectrum too in the blood with some individuals having clones of B cells or T cells, and in rare cases, uh, overt chronic leukemia or acute leukemia in some. So this, this table may be hard to see in this version, but what I wanted to show you are more examples of benign tumors. Mixoid, mixoid fibrous tumor, uh, desmoid is 
can be potentially malignant. Um, polyps and adenoma that are in multiple organs, including the gallbladder and the salivary gland. So uh, that informs the risk benefits as we think about whether to do ubiquitous screening and how often we do the screening. I should add that in most cases, uh, the cancers in these patients were fairly well behaved, although all the patients who died eventually died from a metastatic malignancy. So just to summarize here, when we have short telomere length with aging, that is an advantageous process. It contributes to aging of the cells, but also it protects us against cancer. Whereas when this mechanism of telomere shortening is absent in patients with POT1 mutations, the telomere is stable, if not gets longer. And we were able to show that at these that these POT1 mutation carriers not only have long telomere length, but as they age, they acquire lengthening of the telomere, much against the canonical mechanism of aging. So I'm going to just talk briefly about this because this was a big focus in our paper. The most basic uh, fundamental origin of cancers uh, are thought to be genetic in many cases. And as we age, we acquire somatic mutations in the blood in a phenomenon known as clonal hematopoiesis. And as you know, this affects about 20% of people over the age of um, uh, 70, 80. And it's in a group of, a small group of recurrently mutated genes in the blood. And many of these genes go on to um, be also mutated in hematologic malignancies as well as other cancers. So when we traced the clonality events in patients with long telomere length, or let's say with POT1 mutation carriers here, we found that they had an excess far higher than would be expected, definitely compared to their relatives who don't carry the mutations, but also compared to people their own age. And that turns out precisely to be related to the longevity of the telomere. If you go back clinically, there were other patterns that I think are important uh, and relevant as we talk to patients about this group of diseases, even though the findings are still relatively small. So this family showed clear evidence of genetic anticipation, although the cancer type seems to evolve in later generations. Uh, this is the granddaughter who developed uh, the glioma in the picture I showed you. She also had a myxoid tumor in her thoracic cavity. At the time this patient was diagnosed, her grandmother had no features, but she also, we know now, ca carries the same POT1 mutation that is shared in the daughter. And you have an intermediate generation here that is a silent uh, carrier as of now. This family demonstrates that very clearly where there's clear genetic anticipation and earlier onset of the cancer phenotype almost exactly the same, very different than this one with melanoma, lymphoma, and lymphoma showing up basically 20 years earlier. So the mechanism here of genetic anticipation is related to the fact that not only is the POT1 uh, this says tert promoter mutation, but uh, for the same the identical biology, we can think of this as a POT1 mutation. And in the germline, the loss of one copy of POT1 or its hypomorphic uh, mutation leads to lengthening of the telomere in the germline. We think that this process probably happens more prominently when the parent of origin is male, but I don't have clear data to show you. It's just the clinical impression. And this is exactly the opposite mechanism of what happens in lung disease and the short telomere disorders where, in general, very uh, severe alleles cause genetic anticipation because of telomere shortening. Just to, you know, share this to show you how ubiquitous the phenotype is, and I think we're not done yet. So basically, I'm going to, just for the sake of our um, simplicity, tell you that 
pretty much every cancer has a small subset that is related to POT1, as well as other genes that mimic the phenotype here. But the most common phenotypes are melanoma, papillary thyroid cancer, sarcoma, and lymph lymphoid malignancies. So if you really want to find a POT1 mutation carrier in clinic, find the patient with familial CLL. That is not um, very commonly found, and probably hematologists don't send those patients to us. But at least in this one uh, UK-based study, they found the 10% uh, habit. But this doesn't give us the penetrance. In glioma, at least in adult familial glioma, it's about 3 to 4%. But if you look at the overall penetrance of glioma in patients with POT1 mutations, it's probably going to be on the order of 5%. So the risk benefit of screening is, is not uh, clear cut. I wanted to show a case that I think is, um, is a little bit more straightforward. So the proband with the red uh, left upper quadrant uh, has had multiple melanoma, has, had, uh, has a uterine fibroid, and has a, a POT1 VUS. And I can't read the writing here, but let me see. Um, if you look, her mom also had fibroids and a leiomyosarcoma, and her uncle um, also had a sarcoma. And then you have this history of both a thyroid uh, goiter and uh, a grandfather who, a grandmother who died from uh, lymphoma, T cell leukemia, actually. So if you look here, this is a classic POT1 family. Like even before this patient goes for testing, based on the description of the long telomere syndrome, you can say this is a melanoma, sarcoma, lymphoma syndrome that shows genetic anticipation. And, you know, maybe Lee Fraumani would be in this um, in this group of differentials. Uh, but I think this looks like what I, I think is a classic POT1 syndrome. And she had a, a POT1 VUS. And let me see if we can get the telomere length here. So you see her telomere length is super, super long. This patient has a very high risk of developing multiple other malignancies. But you see the utility here. I can, I, I can tell her she, you know, she should consider the, the, the dermatologic screening is imperative. The, the brain MRI is imperative. She's very high risk for developing lymphoma. So I, I don't know if that example helps in sort of explaining what the role of telomere length uh, may be, but I wanted to share that with you. This is a patient who was in a research study for uh, early onset thyroid cancer and he had multifocal thyroid cancer, multiple nevi, as well as multifocal renal cell cancer. And if you look here, this patient has super long telomeres also. So that may have predicted these risks of malignancies had the POT1 mutation been found. And then his father, since he was diagnosed with se several of these cancers, also developed melanoma and a pituitary adenoma. And you see here, uh, Dr. Paul, the, the genetic anticipation we were talking about and the increase in the telomere length um, over the generations. And this is not invariant, but as I said earlier, it does tend to happen more with males. So this gentleman, his kids should absolutely be tested. You know, I, I think I, I was vague earlier in the vaguer, more vague cases, but with this data in mind, we know this is a loss of function mutation with this pattern. His kids are at risk for developing malignancies at least a decade earlier than the parent. So they should at least be counseled for testing and the telomere length will also inform that and they should be screened. So I think not everything is vague, but there's a lot that I, at least I don't know that we need to figure out still. This is a gentleman who has pulmonary fibrosis and a family history of pulmonary fibrosis. And he has a TERT mutation, but also a POT1 mutation at 30% VAF. 
So the question is, does this patient have short or long telomere length? And both of them were signed out in the um, report uh, at the uh, diagnostics company, and he has super short telomeres. So in this case, this POT1 mutation is a somatic reversion mutation. It's not a germline mutation. It's a way to rescue the blood. And the interpretation here is that this is the germline and this is the somatic mutation. So I just wanted to point that out because that comes up not infrequently. So again, big thank you to Mary Armanios, and uh, we will see you soon. Bye.